This man has been heard on record and live for five or six decades, probably, probably since around about 1966 as a young 18 year old. He started playing professionally, one of the most heard people and he is truly uh, an Australian uh, musical treasure no doubt about it, and definitely a living legend and still going strong, both as a solo performer and in a band. Would you uh, please welcome Phil Manning. <laughs> Phil, so for you, we actually met in 1968. Was it that? Yeah, it would be. Yeah, yes, it, it was um, Strauss Sound Systems. I delivered an amplifier to you. <laughs> That's right. And we've been in and out of each other's lives ever since. But anyway, uh, where did it all start for you in terms of your career, uh, growing up in Tasmania and your education? Uh, well, I went to high school uh, uh, and uh, got a, a, a scholarship to go to art college to be an art teacher. but. By then, music had truly grabbed hold of me. Um, my grandfather, uh, Lou Coventry, got the MBE as a band leader. And uh, <laughs> so I was surrounded by all these aunties and a mother who could all play piano. And so uh, my elder sister and my younger brother and I all went to piano lessons. Um, I did eight years of, of AMEB classical piano. But by the time uh, I was about 14, I was besotted by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and uh, managed to talk my dad into letting me uh, work in his shop uh, on Friday evenings to pay off a guitar, uh, which dad said, I know very well that your, your uh, studies will suffer if you get a guitar. And of course, I got a guitar and yes, they did. Um, but I, uh, I went to art school, uh, having formed a band at school and that sort of thing, I moved down to Hobart to go to art school and uh, was playing down there with, with a couple of great young players and uh, we had a band called Cocaine Spell in Hobart, which before, that was before we even knew what cocaine was. And um, uh, about October of that year, uh, a singer named Tony Worsley uh, came down to Hobart and uh, I ended up getting a, a, a position with him. But actually, I think I'm crossing into the next question, aren't I, really? But yeah, because um, we were going to sort of say, where did your professional career start? Yeah, well, um, I'd read in Go Set magazine, which was the, the big Australian rock magazine of the day, uh, that Vince Maloney, Tony's guitarist, had left to join the Bee Gees. And so when Tony came down to Hobart to perform, he used a local band to back him. And uh, I, I was pushy enough to go backstage and, and say, I'd like to apply for the job. And uh, so Tony went on stage and did his show. And then afterwards, I sat around in the dressing room with him and... Uh, played a bit on someone's borrowed Gretsch guitar. And uh, then Tony said, can you come to Melbourne tomorrow? And I said, oh, give me a day to pack up and stuff. So by the Monday, uh, I was in Melbourne as a member of the Blue Jays. And I was uh, eight, about 18 and a half at that stage, oh, if that. And for those uh, who don't remember, most of you wouldn't, and we're showing our age, but uh, Tony Worsley was actually massive for a little while in Australia. He had number one hits. Uh, um, Velvet Waters. Velvet, Velvet Waters, uh, one, yeah. big hit. And, um, and then, you know, faded reasonably um, quickly, but at one point in time, he was a major big act. Yeah, that's, he, 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 was, he was up there with Normie Rowe and, you know, Digby Richards and all, that, all those artists of the uh, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, and of course, that gradually changed uh, as time went on, and uh, uh, there were less sort of individual artists and more bands came on the scene. 
and you must have been a hell of an 18 year old player to be in a band of that stature at that particular point in time. I, I was enthusiastic, <laughs> oh, I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, uh, I, I, wasn't, I never have been that great a player. I've been fortunate to have always, nearly always worked uh, in bands with far better musicians than myself, which has been great. Uh, the, uh, the benefit of that, obviously, uh, is that you learn and improve your skills. And when I joined the Blue Jays, uh, the drummer was a guy named Jim Tom Jimmy Thompson. And uh, Jimmy was a very simple drummer, but he was uh, absolutely strict on the idea that the rhythm guitar and the drums had to work perfectly together. So. Uh, that was something at that point that I, ha I hadn't really consciously thought of. I just played guitar with, a, with the band, but he made me very aware of the fact that if you were doing a chop on the guitar, it had to sync exactly with the snare drum and be, you know, so you, the idea was to be as tight as possible and sound really slick. So, as I said, uh, he, was, he was a bit older than me and, and I learnt that skill very young. So, um Post Tony Worsley and the Blue Jays, uh, where did you progress to from there? Downwards. Um, <laughs> no, actually, actually upwards. Yeah. We uh, gradually moved nor north with Tony Worsley and then we ended up on the showgrounds uh, because at that time they were putting bands into tents on showgrounds. And the further north we got, the worse the conditions we we, we got until we were sleeping on the tent floor after our shows and I started to just rebel against it. No, this, is, this isn't what I got into the music industry for. And um, so I left, in, I left up in Queensland and came back to Melbourne and um, through uh, looking on notice boards and, and this sort of thing, I discovered that this band called the Bay City Union were looking for a guitar player and uh, went and I, I wouldn't exactly say I applied for the job, I more, in, more invited myself into the job. And uh, through that, I met Matt Taylor and Glenn Wheatley. Uh, Glenn was the rhythm guitarist in the Bay City Union, and of course, Matt Taylor was the singer and harmonica player. And uh, that would have been very early 67, I'd say, from memory. And uh, Matt and I have had a, an on, ongoing association ever since then. So that would lead us into what our um, audience here would know well, and that would be, uh, and I'm sure they want to hear all about, and that was uh, the forming of Chain, yes, which is well, now a legendary band, has, a, has awards named after it, and uh, has, yeah. a, has an album that has been um, in, the, in the shops non-stop for nearly 50 years. But anyway, so well, how, did you form, actually. Yeah, how did you form Chain? Well, uh, the Bay City Union gradually broke up. I went and played for a while with Lo the Laurie Allen Review, which uh, featured Colleen Hewitt and her sister Glennis, um, uh, and also featured Gary Young and Wayne Duncan, who would later become very famous with Daddy Cool. Uh, and through that, a bunch of guys from Perth called The Beaten Tracks heard me play and asked me to, to go to Perth to join them. And as the Laurie Allen Review was sort of winding up at the time, I went off to Perth, worked over there for a while, and then we came back to Melbourne and got this uh, fiery young woman named Wendy Saddington to join the band as the singer. And... Uh, Wendy came up with the name Chain, uh, and uh, it was called Chain, not The Chain, just Chain. Uh, for a time it became The Chain, later on when Michael Godinski became our manager, but it was always just Chain. And uh, Wendy was with the band for probably six months. In, in those days, things sort of seemed to happen very quickly, and... Uh, you look back at it and think, oh, maybe we worked together for two years. You go, no, no, it was only four months. You know? 
But uh, yeah, she was with us for about six months. And then we went through a number of changes uh, uh, until we ended up with a lineup of Matt Taylor, uh, Barry Sullivan, Barry Harvey, and me. And that was the band that, that uh, had Black and Blue and Judgment, and later on the album Toward the Blues, which, as, as Frank said, has been on permanent release for over 50 years now, which is quite incredible, really. So your recording career started soon after. I do recall that you were um, a prodigious band then. You were playing, you know, at many gigs a night. Uh, Chain was very popular and very, ultimately very popular on the festival um, circuit as well. Yeah, and uh, and the, the clubs, there were just yeah. so many clubs. Yeah. Uh, and right from the moment we went out uh, as Chain with Wendy, uh, we beca instantly became a, uh, a very, a very sort of popular band in, in the, the what they called the disco circuit and club circuit at the time. Um, and right through the various lineups that we had uh, through 1968 and 1969 into 1970, uh, we did a lot of work um, at, at clubs like. Uh, Caesar's Place in Sydney, and uh, as I said, eventually uh, it ended up a lineup with Matt Taylor. I should think of a present, a now, uh, we'd already done a recording actually in, in, the, in the Bay City Union. We did a single called Moeen. Uh, in the Bay City Union, and we'd also done a chain single called Show Me Home, which I sang on, uh, and we'd recorded an album after a particular lineup had broken up called Just Chain Live. Um, but they were all very minor recordings, you know, minor successes. And uh, then on the way, uh, uh, well, First of all, we brought Matt Taylor up to Queensland where Barry Sullivan, Barry Harvey and I were. And uh, at our first rehearsal, uh, Matt came up with, well, I had a, a guitar riff and uh, Matt heard me play it. Should, should I play it for you, Frank? Uh, yes, and I think, I think everybody in the room will instantly recognise it. Well, we were, at our first rehearsal, I was just sitting in a corner on my amp and playing... Um, and Matt said, I really like that riff. He said, can you slow it right down? And I thought, oh, oh yes, OK. And, and Matt said at that point, I've always wanted to write a work song. So he went over and sat down in the corner and wrote the whole lyrics just like that, uh, in, virtually in one go. And we worked an arrangement out from there and uh, everyone sort of contributed to it. Um, and that became Black and Blue which we recorded at festival studios in Sydney on our way back to Melbourne. And uh, it, it was such a dirge of a song and yet we really enjoyed playing it and thought it had something going for it. I don't know, I don't know whether the executives at festival, what on earth they thought of it, but um, they certainly didn't think much of a smoking dope in the studio, I know that much. But the, uh, the uh, trip to Melbourne was hilarious because we, we just laughed all our way all the way to Melbourne. 
just like this thing's either going to be a hit or it's going to be the biggest flop known to mankind. And it became a huge hit. And it wasn't until very recently that I discovered why. Because it, it always, always struck me that you know, it's a catchy thing, you know, people sing the weird groanings and all that, but it was such a dirge. And at that time, pop music and, and music was so up and happy, happy, happy. And uh, someone gave me a poster from 1971 where Michael Gadidsky, who was managing us, was also running dances. And he'd put Chain on as the headliner at these dances. And what, what he'd do, because in those days, uh, every week, the record shops would put in a report as to how many singles they sold. You know, uh, Gary Puckett and the Union Gap sold 15 this week, you know, and so and so. And then that, from that, they'd compile the charts. And your position in the charts was a bona fide position based on how many singles you sold. And so what <laughs> Michael did, he went around and bought all the singles from all, the, all our singles from all the record shops and then advertised Chain playing tonight at Ring Box Hill Town Hall or Ringwood Town Hall or somewhere. Entry, $1.50, get free single of Ch Chain's new single. So he'd get his money back for buying the single. <laughs> and Ch and the, the DJs who didn't want to play the thing at all were forced to play it because it actually got into the charts. And once it got into the charts and they had to play it, it then took up its own momentum and people start buying it right, left and centre. But I've always thought that was a, a magnificent bit of management. <laughs> Bit of a Brian Epstein touch there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much so. Yeah. And um, so tell me, it, it would um, it was such a big, big single that um, it stayed in the charts for many, many weeks, didn't it? Yeah, for months, yeah. perhaps. Um, did was there not a entry in the Guinness Book of Records, or was that is that the album? Uh, I yeah, there there, there is something. I'm, I can't remember what it is. Something to do with Highest rating blues song. Well, the only the only blues band to reach number one in Australia, or something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't remember exactly. I don't really. F uh, I don't keep up with the Guinness Book of Records that much. But um, yeah, it, it definitely stayed. The thing was, uh, Sydney radio was very much controlled uh, by. Uh, religious interests, shall we say, and they absolutely refused to play Black and Blue because the connotations of... It was basically a convict song and, uh, and, and very sort of anti-establishment. And uh, at the time, of course, uh, the anti-Vietnam movement was very big. And so a song that had this sort of anti-establishment, convict sort of uh, attitude in it um, resonated quite a lot with, with the audience. And uh, so Sydney Radio weren't at all keen on, on, on playing that single. Uh, but the second single we did, Judgment, they loved that one. Uh, and it must have been because it mentioned God in it, I think. Yeah, here I stand before you, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so moving on to Judgment, that was your follow-up single to Black and Blue. That's right. Right, and that sold pretty well too, didn't it? Yeah, that sold uh, very well. That reached number two. Uh, the, uh, the thing that's very interesting is that we then recorded uh, Toward the Blues, uh, and uh, Festival wanted to put the single of Black and Blue on the album. But we dug our heels in and said, no, we want the album to have a, a concept. We want it to be an album, not just a, you know, a mish, mishmash of things. So we re-recorded Black and Blue in the studio when we did Toward the Blues, uh, just so that it, the whole thing worked as a, as a unit. Uh, and that 
uh, started to sell really well and over a period of years eventually became double gold. But what's interesting, Frank, is that the band with Matt Taylor and Big Goose, Little Goose and myself only went for 11 months. So we did all that in 11 months. Uh, and at the same time, we were working five, six nights a week, two gigs on Saturday, you know, an afternoon and a, a night time one, that sort of thing. And, um, and it basically burnt us out. And uh, uh, after 11 months, people started leaving and we got new members in and uh, the whole thing changed. But between um, 1968 and 1974, there were 26 members went through chain. Uh, goodness knows what it would be by now, about 56. Beginning of holiday, truth hides in a sewer, and people who are just become fewer. Truth hides in a drain pipe, but where can you hide when you find you're choking, you're gasping inside? Towards the Blues, you recorded that at TCS Studios, which was part of the Channel 9 network That's station right. in Melbourne, a, uh, uh, a studio designed by another Cedar Archive of Excellence individual, namely Colin Stevenson. Yes, indeed. And uh, the big old op Optronics desk. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was actually, the Ch TCS Studios was actually a great studio. Um, a huge room, probably, probably about, it'd probably be a little bit bigger than this room, wouldn't it? Yeah. The actual studio space itself. Um, and uh, it, it was a really good studio. I did a lot of work in there over the years. And uh, of course, it, uh, the Toward the Blues album was engineered by uh, John Sayers, great engineer. Um, and that album, uh, we were in the studio for a few days and f the first couple of days were just a complete waste of time. The, we just couldn't, didn't seem to play well or whatever it was, we, we don't know. But uh, then one afternoon, mid-afternoon, I think we'd probably, we'd had a couple of scotches and probably, uh, uh, probably had a joint or two. Uh, everything came together and the whole album was recorded in about, I don't know, two and a half hours. And then the next day we mixed it. But uh, uh, it, was, it was just amazing the way nothing happened and then it just suddenly all came together and, and was recorded quickly. But let's backtrack. Is it any wonder because that, that line-up, that's just... Uh that's a star studded, that's some of the cream of Australian musicianship when you look at bass player Barry Sullivan. Yeah, well, ba Barry, Barry, of course, had, uh, had come from a band called, the Thurs called Thursday's Children, and he was, um, he was not a great guitar player, he was certainly a proficient guitar player, uh, and, and he knew what he was doing, but he swapped over to bass and it was just a duck to water. He just took it up and then uh, th the Thursday's children broke up and Barry Sullivan and Barry Harvey locked themselves in a flat in St Kilda and played 
nothing but bass and drums together for three months. And they listened to all the, uh, the, all the records they could get their hands on and listen to what the bass player and drummers were doing and they practiced playing together. So uh, at, at, at one point well, through one of these lineups, Warren Morgan on piano and I uh, went to Melbourne and joined up with uh, Barry Sullivan and Barry Harvey. Uh, we had one run through, one rehearsal of a bunch of stuff in the afternoon and went out and played on a multi-bill show that night and, and we were by far the tightest band on it. It was amazing. Um, and it was just because Barry and Barry had just spent months. So they'll, they'll go down in history as, as a, one of the all-time great pairings. Of, well, you know, I, I, section, I, I think they certainly should, though. <laughs> They were, uh, were an astonishing thing. And, ba and Barry Sullivan, uh, of course, uh, back in, in, in the 70s, uh, he was doing, it was a point where he was virtually doing all base session work that you could get. It was just, yeah. He was in the studios every day. It was incredible. And then, of course, Barry, Barry um, Harvey was quite a unique drummer, yeah, you know, listening to Chain, but he had a, yeah, well, a unique... Yeah, well, he, he, he was a Wonder Boy drummer. He was, he was uh, playing uh, bebop jazz and, uh, and mm. big band stuff uh, with, with adult bands when he was about nine or ten. Yeah. And then, of course, there was Matt Taylor with that unique voice. Yeah. And, and then your modest self, who many, most of us... Dub G, the Clapton of Australia. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, <laughs> so, so, and still do, many people still do. You say, what a band, you know, like, well, will you go and see Chain Live? That was an experience. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think one, one thing that I, I, I remember Matt Taylor, on, this, and this was back in the Bay City Union, where we were playing uh, blues uh, a la Chicago blues. We were basically copying you know, Buddy Guy and Howling Wolf and Muddy Waters and that sort of thing. And uh, I remember Matt saying, you know, this, this will actually lead us nowhere. We need to write our own songs, our own material. And we started doing that uh, from that point. And, and, and if we were to do an old blues song, we try and adapt it uh, in, a, in, a, in an original way. And I, th I think that's... And that's one of the keys to, to, to any musical success is to have some originality. Definitely, definitely. And so, after Chain, um, what did you do? Because um, Chain broke up, didn't it? Then reformed. And well, it, Chain it goes broke on. up, formed, <laughs> broke yeah. There's been many lineups, as I've said. Yeah, but then uh, after that, that, that quintessential Chain, after that, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, well, I... I I tried a couple of things with uh, little bands that I put together uh, and I did a, a solo album called I Wish There Was A Way um, and I, I was trying to sort of fuse electric music with acoustic music somehow and, um, and that was where a, a noticeable thing came between you and I where uh, I went and saw Jan Ackerman play with Focus and I loved the sound of his guitar, and I was sitting a, a way back and couldn't really tell what it was, but I was, it looked like a Gibson Les Paul, but it looked slightly different. And I, Frank and I tried to work out what it might be, and then Frank came up with the idea. He said, well, if you love it so much, why don't we look at going to Mason and see if they'll make you a custom guitar? And uh, so I, I thought about it, thought, put my ideas together. Frank took me out to meet them, and... Uh, next thing we had the Phil Manning custom stereo uh, on the market and, uh, and Frank of course was working with Brashes at the time and Brashes were behind the national promotion of it. And, uh, yeah, we had exclusive rights and boy do we sell a lot of product. We, we, we did, in a period of time there was a lot of guitars went and then of course we introduced a second model. That's right, the standard model, yeah. Yeah. and. Um, Many, many great players uh, received them or bought them, including Eric Clapton. Well, which, I gave him one, yeah, actually. And, and that ended up with George Terry, Eric's... Apparently so, yeah. Yeah, and then Canned Heat, um, Harvey Mandel. 
Yeah, he got a standard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Sweet, that English pop band. That's right, the Sweet <laughs> yeah. had one too. Yeah. yeah. They had um, a custom stereo, yeah. So it was, a, it was a hot product at the time. But if I can just cut in for 30 seconds, um, at, at the time, um, I was the product manager f uh, for Brashes and we were re representatives of certain um, uh, major brands. Um, and at that period of time, the musical instrument industry had become very corporatised. Um, a lot of, because music was so big, or in their eyes it was, and very profitable, so they thought. So these big corporations were buying these iconic brands. And one of these brands we represented, and um, at that period of time, every stinking guitar that came in, you know, had to be serviced. You know, the, 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 the quality was that bad. But this was happening across all of America. You know, the pro, you know um, finish problems, just not putting things together well. In fact, the, we'd get, get shipments and then we'd just ship them straight to a repairer, not even look at them ourselves. You know, we, we, we'd ask for 100% of all the guitars, and they weren't cheap, you know, to be serviced and made playable. And um, so when Phil came in to talk about this in the back of my mind, was if this is gonna continue, this quality thing, we should do something ourselves in this country, and we've got a, an ideal maker who, in my mind, needed a bit of direction with their electric guitars, you know, in terms of what they, um, but, and also to have a name like Phil behind it, who was uh, up there as uh, Australia's premier guitar player. Um, that was uh, one of the motive. So, it were, you know, we all had good motives for doing, uh, doing this, and it was very successful for a while. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so we've spoken about that car guitar, and it was called uh, um, Maton Phil Manning Custom Stereo. It was a stereo guitar. And the standard version came out as a standard guitar. And it was uh, beautifully made. But it did, I mean, it did have its failings, didn't it? And uh, yeah. yeah, well, um, I mean, there were, there were elements that, that, uh, that I would have liked to have changed. Uh, but you know that, that's that's stuff that's all in retrospect. And uh, at at the time, I I absolutely adored it. I loved playing it. Was fa fabulous. But um, uh, there there was a period, I guess, a bit later on, when I I just started to want a Fender again. Um, there's just something about the Fender electrics that you know once it gets in your blood, you, it's a bit hard to get it out. <laughs> And um, so, yeah, later on in the 80s, I became a Fender Australia artist and uh, I've played Fender Electrics ever since. And uh, uh, my son ended up with my, uh, my prototype. He got, he got that for his 21st birthday, so. The Phil Manning Custom Stereo Guitar, um, if you can get one, is selling for big money on the second-hand market. And uh, if, you know, I, I don't recall how many uh, we sold. It wasn't thousands, but it was certainly many, many hundreds. And I do, I do know that uh, the owners of Maton, Billy and Vera May, at, at, did a, came along at the right time for them as a guitar maker. And they're still very popular to this day, but it, uh, I don't know whether it saved the company. I wouldn't go that far, but it certainly, had a big impact on their ability to su sustain themselves as a car m guitar maker. So it was a good period. It was a good uh, teaming up. So moving on, because we're entertainment technology folk here, and so you gradually um, developed your own production capability, you know, at, at home. And, um, and that album that we were talking about and promoting is a testament to that because it's uh, the album that Phil, he's done everything, you know, played everything, um, uh, recorded it, mixed it. I don't think you mastered it. Did uh, you? No, no, I, uh, um, uh, uh, no, I, I got Rob Dylan to master it. Right. Well, it's a hell of a, 
if you if you get it, it's a beautifully balanced album. It's it's um, it's it's as good, if not better, than a lot of things that are coming out these days, in terms of albums. It's a really good effort. So you obviously do have a production capability and skill. Well, um, I moved up to Tambourine Mountain in southern Queensland in the early 80s, and I did a, a, a little solo album where I went into a studio and sat there and, and basically did a live performance. Then I repeated it and then picked the best out of it and made a little album. And it sold fabulously well. And I, uh, and I went, well, you know, this is the way to go for me, just independent recording. So uh, I went out and bought, I've still got it, a little, uh, little tiny little Mackie mixer about this big, uh, an ADAT machine, uh, a Yamaha SPX 990 uh, multi-effects unit, uh, courtesy of Frank, a couple of Octava microphones, and um, started home recording. And quite frankly, I haven't looked back since, since it's been... Uh, the, the thing that you, you, you obviously miss out on when you become an independent and you do your home recording and that sort of thing. The, the one thing that you really miss out on uh, is the grunt that you get in the publicity department from a major record company. Uh, but you pay for that. Um, and uh, so whilst uh, my sales uh, in record shops and that sort of thing may not have been great right through the 80s, 90s and up to the present. In fact, in the rec they've become virtually non-existent as far as record stores are concerned. At live gigs and, on and online, uh, it it's been fabulous. And uh, there's just something so, uh, there's something really nice about doing home production. Uh, and uh, then again, once you've done a real lot of home production, it's also nice to then go into a real studio as well, because uh, there's, there's, there's a certain excitement about a real studio. And, um, but I'm, I'm still sticking with the home production and with the new album, because of the lockdown, uh, I realised I wasn't be going to be able to go into a studio and lay down rhythm tracks for, for the electric things. So I uh, bought myself a bass <laughs> and uh, a very basic set of drum pads and uh, played everything myself. It's even got a little bit of keyboard that came from picking up a, a 10 or $15 keyboard from out the front of a Salvation Army store uh, footpath sale. <laughs> and uh, so uh, anyway, it was great fun making it. And, um, uh, and that's obviously a thing f that from the 80s uh, onwards, uh, well, even f well, actually from the 70s, of course, in the 70s, the little Porter studio c came out where you could record four tracks onto a cassette. Uh, and of course, the quality was not that great, but it was nevertheless uh, uh, a big development. And then by the 80s, th things started to really pick up. ADATs came out. Uh, and uh, so uh, it, it put the creative process much more into the musician's hands. And as you would all know, that's just gone forward in leaps and bounds now. And uh, the, uh, even, even things, uh, things that were, say, $5,000 10 years ago, and now you'll pick one something up for about 150 bucks. It may not be as good, but it works. And, uh, that particularly, I've noticed in microphones, um, some of the microphones that you can get that are, you know, are pretty hard to tell the difference between a, uh, a Neumann and, and, and a, a Sennheiser and some of these cheaper brands, uh, it, some of them make it uh, pretty close. They get pretty close to it. Now, at the start, uh, I mentioned um, that uh, you, one of the most heard in, in, in terms of recording and, and live musicians in Australia 
what we haven't sort of touched upon briefly is the amount of session work you've done. And in fact, there's some, um, th th there's little things that I've picked up, like you were the guitar player on Frankie Davidson's The Ball Bearing Bird. <laughs> it was indeed. <laughs> the Ball Bearing Bird. The Ball Bearing Bird. <laughs> I was and you know why? You know it's you because of the wah wah, the style. Yeah, well, and I, I remember that was a very demanding session actually, because uh, I was always, uh, always been uh, in in session work. I've nearly always been used for my creative input and the fact that uh, that I can think of ideas fairly quickly, but. I can think of ideas very quickly, but I'm not very good at repeating them. Uh, so uh, as far as really formulating stuff, uh, I'm not that great at, at, my memory just wanders, I think it's probably, probably some ADHA or something, whatever they call it. Um, so uh, yeah, with Frankie Davis' thing, it had to go and it had to be the same every time, it was really hard, it was a, Tough session, actually, but, uh, but, a, yeah. but a good one and a fabulous um, <laughs> song. Um, but there's been um, there's been many others, haven't there? There's been many albums you've done and many artists you've supported. John Paul Young. Yeah, uh, well, I did the Green album with John Paul Young, but probably, yeah. You know, when I when I look back at it and think about the hundreds of sessions that I did, um, some of the ones that are probably the most rewarding. Looking, you know, thinking about it is some of the stuff that I did for, uh, with Russell Morris uh, back on Wings of the Eagle and uh, uh, Sweet Sweet Love. Uh, and I, I remember once driving somewhere in the middle of nowhere and listen, just casually listening to the radio and I switched it over and I went, shit, who's that guitar player? Wow, that's great. <laughs> and then I realised it was the end of <laughs> Wings of an Eagle or something, and it was yeah. me. It was it was a really funny thing because I'm normally uh, I'm normally quite paranoid, and I think I think uh, most artists are. You, you have a, tend to have uh, an idea that you've, what you've done is not good enough. You could do it better, and you know usually the producer will say, "No, that's great. Just leave it." And you leave the session and go, oh, I'm sure I could have done better. But then you hear things later on and you go, actually, that's not half bad. And I find that happens with my own recordings all the time. I, I, and it, it's happened a lot with me lately, with listening back to uh, some chain things that I always thought were really like, oh, every time I heard it, I cringed. But having not heard them now for 30 years, I, I'll listen to it and go, cool. Oh, that's surprisingly okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and as we um, draw to a close, um, it's very, it's very, very interesting, uh, isn't it? Because I know from independent sources, aside from yourself, that you still to a chain, rarely, but you still to to a chain, and I think you just sell out everywhere you go. Yeah, it's really quite amazing. Very and, uh, popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just did a run, three shows through Melbourne, uh, and they were sold out. And um, what, Quickly. What, <laughs> what's really surprising is now we get people who come to the show that say, oh, I, you know, I used to see you guys in 71 at the Thumping Tunnels, <laughs> you, you know. And then you'll get someone else who'll say, I've been listening to you all my life because my father loved your band. But now you're getting people saying, I've been listening to you all my life because my grandparents always used to play it. <laughs> <laughs> so you do get quite a broad demographic to Very your Very much so. In fact, a couple of years ago, just, be, just before the lock, whole lockdown thing, um, we did a show at the Memo and some young guy, who was, it was his 21st birthday and he brought like 20 or 30 of his friends along and they had never heard us before, and they just went absolutely bananas. It was a really, I don't know, it, it was a very, very warm feeling, I can tell you. Well, that's because uh, Chain are unique, 
uh, have a unique sound and you've always maintained your integrity, you've always maintained um, your sound, you know what you want. And, and, um, well, I don't know whether it's what we want, it's what we get. Yeah, but uh, God help the audio engineer who puts his own interpretation onto your mix at a live show. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, woo. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that can be a bother. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and I guess, but then with Chain um, and the occasional things that you do, Blues Fest and all of those um, iconic um, events, you also still do your solo stuff as we heard last night and that's also in demand and very different from chain and so you know given your experience and you I don't, don't want to say age but <laughs> you I think can. it's, it's I, think right, it, you can. I think it's remarkable but you mentioned Russell Mollis look how well he's doing you know yeah. incredibly well you know so more power to you and I guess at this particular point would you thank Phil? Yeah.